Uh, a very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to the IOSH Offshore Group webinar on managing substance misuse in the workplace. Uh, my name is Mark Jenkins, and I have the privilege to be the chair of the Offshore Group. Um, I would now like to introduce Trevor Hall, who is the Group Executive Chairman and Chief Operations Officer for Hall & Angus. Trevor himself is a published authority on substance misuse. He works mainly with uh, blue chip companies internationally, uh, works closely with a number of insurance providers and a variety of industry bodies. Um, Trevor's expertise in the field of workplace substance misuse has enabled him to form strong relationships with a number of UK in and international universities and provide expert witness supports to the courts and to develop training and testing protocols for clients that are generally world-class and market leading. It is therefore uh, a genuine privilege that Trevor has taken time out uh, of his busy schedule to give an overview of substance misuse management today. And I certainly look forward to hearing about the latest developments and the threat that substance misuse has to international business. So Trevor, a very good morning and or afternoon even, and over to you. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, this uh, webinar should answer a lot of the questions you may have already in your minds or raise other questions when you possibly may learn something different. I'm going to share a screen initially uh, to give you a slideshow, which is only a, an aid memoir for me. I intend to walk through this in a different way but let you see what we're talking about you can all have copies of this slideshow and others if you wish uh, you can get them through uh, iosh or mark or myself by direct contact we've got on the slideshow itself straight away four points of contact that if you copy down but these contact details if are there for you at any time when we talk about substance misuse management in the workplace, people think it's about writing a policy or it's a duty of HR or it's a duty of health and safety or it's a duty of occupational health. The reality is everybody's got a piece of it, but nobody wants all of it. And that's where Hall and Angus come in. We manage substance misuse in the workplace across its entirety. And that entirety is training, education, schools, analytics, investigations, just about every aspect where we need to remove this negative in the workplace and replace it with positives. The reason I bring this up is when I advise the global insurance industry, I've reviewed over 3,000 global policies now for major companies, large and small, uh, it's not just about the, cor the corporate bodies. The SMEs have got the equal uh, need for all of this. When we look at the policies, I have not yet found one legally defensible or fit for purpose. It starts from the auspices that substance misuse and its management is introduced under health and safety. It isn't. Substance misuse is covered by criminal and civil legislations, statutory requirements and terms and conditions of employment. If you look at the health and safety work regulations here in the UK or anywhere else in the world, not one of them mention or talk to you about how to implement or manage a substance misuse program. That's an issue because a lot of people have a lot of caps to wear and they pay scant uh, attention to what is ultimately a very serious issue when it goes wrong. When we look at workplace substance misuse, we need to identify actually what is it. So you should be able to see a slide here which outlines uh, the vast majority of, of the circumstances when we start looking at substance misuse, controlled drugs under the Misuse of Drugs Act here in the UK, or other legislations around narcotics in, in other countries. Misuse of prescribed medications on prescription, both legal and illegal. Misuse of prescribed medications off prescription, generally illegal. 
misuse of psychoactive substances, what were legal highs. This is a growing trend, obviously, and has been for some years now, but people are getting to grips with it uh, in the way it's managed and analysed in, in the um, laboratories. Self-medication by over-the-counter legal medications being mixed with other substances and alcohol. Self-medication by use of black market and internet products. People are bypassing import controls and prescribed medicine controls by being able to go to suppliers on the internet and get some really strong drugs, painkillers uh, and, and medication drugs. Alcohol legal. Well, alcohol is a pleasure to most people, but it's, a, it's actually an illness to others. 28% of global alcohol is counterfeit. So that's another issue that we have to deal with in the workplace. Solvents, glues and gases. They're covered in the UK now under the Psychoactive Substances Act. You may not have that in your country, but solvent, glues and gases do have a good many issues in the workplace, especially in confined working. Anabolic steroids, people are confused whether these are legal or illegal. Well, in the UK, if you import them without a license, it's illegal. If you've got possession of them from an unlicensed source, it's illegal. So then you have to deal with the illegal element of that within your substance misuse management program. And mixing any, mixing any combination of the above things that you can see there, if you can see them, or the ones that I've read to you, they all blend into a dystopian environment where people are operating in a false reality by self-medication or other routes to drugs. Now, people go into substance misuse through a myriad of circumstances. It's not just around um, building up a tolerance to your prescribed medications. Drugs start off at a level and then the human body responds by having a tolerance where you always need more. And that's the same with alcohol, that's the same with codeine, that's the same with a lot of substances. So all of these situations have to be allowed for in the modular approach that we recommend to building a substance misuse management program. But just some stats for you. I don't know what they are in your own countries. I do know some countries. But the UK, UK private and public sector employment pool is 35 plus million people. What is it globally? The employer can actually impact the thought process, change the culture, and apply the laws across a very, very large body of people globally. And when I was in the police as a drug squad officer, we were restricted by uh, geographics, by budget, by all sorts of situations. We couldn't go anywhere at any time to do anything. Well, Hall and Angus can, and we do. And so, attacking the safety of the whole global employment pool captures a lot of initiatives and a lot of good that can be delivered into the workplace. And studies have shown, certainly since I've been involved with them, since the late 90s, that if we use hair analysis, in the UK we were testing one in four positives of potential employees at pre-employment testing. In America it was one in five. We can manage that down to about one in 16 people uh, by having that in place as a deterrent. But the longer it's in place at a pre-employment basis for hair analysis, then uh, the more people avoid coming to that workplace that's got these robust uh, and strong countermeasures in place to stop uh, accidents in the workplace and the other criminality that comes with substance misuse. We now know clearly from a lot of studies that have gone on that 76% of substance misuses are actually in employment and 44% of them admit to selling uh, drugs to work colleagues. So whatever's in society is in the workplace. It hasn't gone away, it's just moved a location. The employer, however, is better positioned, believe it or not, to manage these negatives out of the workplace that can't be managed out of society. Of those UK substance misusers who are in treatment, 15 to 20% are in work. So people are coming to work under the influence of illegal substances while they're in treatment. So there's got to be some form of mitigation in a policy or a substance misuse management program there to guide them through working in a risk environment. And certainly in the offshore scenario, um, you've got more risks 
uh, than you do have on a shore-based operation. However, the Substance Misuse Management Programme for ashore as well as uh, offshore is almost the same. But I'll come back to that a little bit later. There are some minor deviations with regards to how you manage a substance misuse incident offshore. So policies and testing, testing protocols need to reflect some of these uh, statistics I've shown you above. The policy is about procedures and testing is about evidence. And if you have no evidence and you have no policy, your procedures are not going to fly. The next slide is just some additional statistics that shows again in the UK, and again, we don't know what they are in your own countries, but that's for you to research. 38% of UK drug users with a psychiatric disorder were receiving no treatment whatsoever for that disorder. And again, going back to my time in law enforcement, there were issues that we had to deal with mental health in the community. No different in the workplace. And people, some people, have mental health issues because of the workplace. They're intimidated when they go there, or they've got stressed because of work, and other issues because of work. They all have to be managed and dealt with. And for anybody who says, we don't care what our employees do in their private lives, they need to come out of the dark side because whatever goes on in society does come into the workplace. And if it's illegal and criminal and has consequences, which this does, then the employer at some point is going to have to manage that problem at a cost. So the more countermeasures you can have in place to prevent this, the better. Who mental health costs the UK employers 8.4 billion in sickness and absenteeism? and 15.1 billion in reduced productivity. And that's a study done by uh, ACAS. Um, and they've also identified that alcohol and drug policy should be used to ensure problems are dealt with effectively and consistently. Well, that's why you need a substance misuse management program as opposed to a standalone policy allied to a standalone um, EAP, Employee Assistance Program, allied to a standalone testing package allied to other policies that might cross over this, policies such as driving hands-free, uh, driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol, which is now covered under the Road Traffic Act in the UK. What it is in your countries, I'm not quite sure, but they'll have to be uh, managed within the programme just as much. Now, ACAS have also said, uh, employers have legal obligations under the Health and Safety at Work Act and the Transport and Works Act. Well, they do but none of them direct what you should do in the management of substance misuse in the workplace. Criminal acts do, certain civil legislations do, certain statutory requirements do. And with regards to terms and conditions of employment, it's everybody's fiduciary duty in the UK to be fit for work. We would make that an easier understand by saying it's everybody's legal duty to be fit for work when they present for work. It's called a fiduciary duty in this country because employees pay taxes, they pay pension contributions, NHS costs with national insurance. Employers pay pension contributions and other taxes. That's why it's called a fiduciary duty. So having established you've got a legal duty as an employee to be fit for work, that work has to be controlled under corporate governance. And corporate governance allocates culpability of the officers of the, country, of the company under criminal and civil law, statutory requirements and terms and conditions of employment. Now, if that makes sense, um, I hope it does. How many people have we got here that are actually officers of a company? Because these are the guys that are prosecuted in law when things go wrong. And this, what you see in front of you, is a very basic uh, definition of corporate governance, which is that system of rules, practices, policies and processes by which a company is directed and controlled. And it essentially states that it involves the balancing of the interests of a company's many stakeholders, such as the shareholders, the management, customers, suppliers, financiers, insurers, government and community. So if we take out the key elements of what corporate governance is, you will see that they are basically the rules, the practices, the policies and the processes of running a business within the law 
hopefully providing a very, very safe environment for people to come to, not one for them to be uh, afraid of. And in the offshore industry, it's a little bit more applicable in as much as that some people are on ships dealing with rolling decks that their counterparts are on steady, um, stable land. You've got the rigs, you've got all sorts of drillhead operations, you've got lots of other additional risks you probably don't see ashore. But then again, the shore has the same problems. Therefore, the solution has to be the same again. At Hall and Angus, we believe very much in a modular approach to building a substance misuse management program. The first one is the program implementation process. This is the methodology by which you appoint a committee. If a company has nothing or no, nothing in place with regards to substance and alcohol misuse management, you need to start a process, usually with an amnesty period that allows you the time to enroll that process, have consultation because it may, it may need changes in terms and conditions of people's employment, it would certainly need additions into your administrative, administrative controls if you're ISO accredited or anything else. That process is three months. In that time, you train your people, you train your uh, managers, you train, you train your team leaders, you train your collectors in-house. I don't believe very much in bringing um, independent collectors to market, but it's there if you need it. You can't do that in the middle of the ocean. You can't do that on a ship. So we're making ships self-sufficient. We're making the offshore industry self-sufficient in managing their own substance misuse governance. The EAP is the Employee, Employee Assistance Programme. That's the means by which um, we deal with people who have a problem. Now, if people self-refer a, a drug problem or an alcohol problem or any other problem for that matter, it could be any form of uh, disorder, uh, gambling addiction, porn addiction, whatever else you you know that comes to the, to the table. They cannot be dismissed in law, so they have to be dealt with. So once they come forward and you've got nothing in place, you've got to start from scratch. So whether you use the program or not, or you actively test or not, you should have a complete and robust substance misuse management program in place. The SAM is the substance and alcohol misuse policy. That's the policy, and this is the starting point where everything goes very badly wrong in the workplace. Very badly wrong. I'll come back to that. The next item of the modular approach is the program of testing, quite appropriately named as POT. The program of testing has to be legal. It has to cover wide and narrow window test mediums, evidential and non-evidential testing. There is a lot to consider here. It's not just simply a case of swabbing somebody or sending them to a toilet to do whatever they've got to do, and then you're going to get an instant result. That's not the way to do things. I am not a great believer in testing for testing's sake. You should only test if you have a reason to test. The reasons can be many. Pre-employment, post-incident, rehabilitation, all sorts of other areas. Moving on, we ask the question then, what actually is a substance misuse management program? Having identified the four elements of it and having aligned it with the company's corporate governance, we've then got to make sure that it protects the employer, the employees and the business. And each element needs to comply with criminal and civil applications, statute requirements, and enhanced fees and fees of employment, applied within a wider risk management capability to make fair presentation to its insurance provider, its own corporate governance, and those charged with its enforcement. Because while we've discussed here that it's the officers of the company and the directors of those companies that are culpable in law, it's the managers and the directors, who are not company directors, who are probably both culpable and responsible if they don't know what they're doing, if they cause the law to be broken by their management style or their lack of understanding of their, them exposing their workmates to a breach of law. The bottom, side, the bottom uh, panel of this just outlines what I uh, discussed earlier. 
it's the four elements. These are the four elements you've got to build in their entirety. If you don't build them, you're going to be left short. So why is it important to practice good corporate governance? Well, it encompasses the rules, practices, policies, and processes that a company relies on to make formal decisions, manage the company, and to manage and mitigate risk. If I can just stick on that a minute, if you don't know what you're doing and you haven't got your program in place, legally defensible, and certainly open to closer scrutiny, it could cost the company its reputation, a lot of money and fines, and possibly custodial sentences when things go wrong, especially if it comes to fatalities in the workplace. And they happen every day. So employing good corporate governance helps the company to regulate that risk, mitigate criminal and civil legislations, and reduce the opportunity for loss within the company's control. It also helps the the company brought in under any of those four elements, but at the same time enhance, enhance good practices and the positives to the benefit, of the benefit of the company and the employees as well. Contractors should be always uh, compliant with company policy or the company program, not their own. If they're coming in to work on your premises, they're subject to your rules and your guidelines. Don't let them do their own thing. So, a little bit more of an explanation then, based on these four parts of a modular program. Program implementation process, which requires the amnesty period, the EAP, the policy and the pot. Now, if you remember from the first slide around corporate governance, good old British uh, news. The program implementation process outlines in our in our eyes and our identity of this the rules practices policies and processes by which the company builds and communicates each step of the development of the substance misuse management program who it applies to and when from these actions can become part of terms and conditions of employment certainly service level agreements with contractors tendering protocols all of these things are put in place over a three-month period, hopefully with a group of people working together within a corporate body to say, where do we want to be with this? What is our corporate governance saying about this? Where are we exposed to criminal law? Where are we exposed to our weaknesses? Have we made fair presentation to our insurers about how we manage this risk? This is all part of the program implementation process. Add to this the training of those people who are going to be the uh, champions within the workplace uh, to make sure the system works. Add to this the people who can be trained as collectors, be a rapid response mechanism within the workplace. Um, and especially with the guys at sea and offshore, where you can't call an independent collector in. The employee assistance program. We've taken the same corporate governance approach, the rules, practices, policies, and processes by which the company manages its employees with regard to a recovery-oriented assistance program and the assessment of fitness for duty. So we're back to this legal duty of the employee to be fit for work when they present for work. And if they're involved in criminal activity that renders them unfit for work, there's got to be a consequence. You can't just let that ride. The other thing with the EAP, it must be recovery oriented it's no good having somebody on a methadone uh, maintenance program that lasts 10 years the employer can't carry maintenance programs which don't attack the core problem area of the substance misuse abuse moving into a disorder there's a progression with drugs as there is with alcohol and other things you start with a misuse you progress then to abuse because it's starting to take hold. It's starting to become a little bit more important in your life. And then you move to this dependency stroke disorder. We can call it whichever way we want, uh, but that's your addiction element. Now, if we've got to that stage, it's gone too far. We need to be managing this within the misuse and hopefully stopping it before it gets to becoming abuse because that then means that nobody's concentrating on health and safety that they should be or other elements of their workplace. So the EAP 
and these are in order of importance as well. When you start a program, you start with your program implementation process. And I have a separate PowerPoint if anybody would like to have that to do this step-by-step -step process. It's too big for this particular uh, delivery. The EAP is the next thing you must have in place almost immediately because when you announce you're going to introduce a new or a modified um, substance misuse management program, you must give people the opportunity to come forward and self-refer. That could happen on day one. So when you've started this policy implementation process, in tandem, you must have already created your employee assistance program. And we have the templates to give you on that basis and to give you the, the head start that you need without having to review too many uh, issues. The next thing that comes along is your policy, your substance and alcohol misuse policy. Now I said earlier, this is where I get all of my problems. When I review all of the policies that I do, they all start from, this does not form the basis of a contract. Well, it does because you've got to have waivers for your submission of substances uh, or samples to a laboratory. You need other elements in your terms and conditions of employment about that duty to be fit for work and a great many other things, which are too many to go into at this stage. They also start by putting in uh, acts and sections of a variety of legislations. It's completely wrong. In the UK, I've identified 39 different legislations that are applicable to managing a workplace substance misuse program. If you only put one or two in, you're missing out 37, which are equally as important, if not more important than the two you've put in. The other thing, of course, by putting acts and sections in your policy of legislations, you then have to defend that act and section to the letter of the law. All you need to do in a policy, in a policy document, is, is, is identify to the reader that the company is required to comply with a range of criminal and civil legislations and statutory requirements. And then when that specific contravention occurs, you just deal with that specific contravention. Not all 39 or 100 or whatever else is going on. People are still arguing in courts about the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. What chance have you got in litigation as an employer? So with your policy, we'll come back to the policy a little bit uh, later. We'll go into that a little bit more in depth. There's some very, very simple basics. A policy that has so many criminal and civil legislations applied to it has to be a set of standards that are applied to a set of people that when breached have a range of consequences within the substance misuse management program. How can you have a situation where you're talking to people about the effects of a hallucinogenic drug, a stimulant drug or a depressant drug, which is not enforceable in policy? Yet I view policies of 50 pages of pure waffle or general information or information that is not enforceable as part of the management of criminal and civil legislation, which is where substance misuse generally sits, not always. So there's a great many things there for people to consider straight away that the policy has to be brief enough so that it does it, it it's got to be brief but not too brief that it doesn't protect the, the business or the people if it's too verbose people can sit and read 47 pages because they're entitled to read the policy before they're tested how long is it going to take them to read all of this waffle the policy should be very succinct and outline the standards set by the company, identified by their governance and their compliance with criminal and civil legislations. Anything else is just unnecessary. Moving then on to the program of testing is the last thing that you introduce. It's again back to the rules, practice, policies and processes to legally measure and report the employee's fiduciary duty to be fit for work within a framework of test mediums and defensible toxicology cutoffs. When I sit and talk with or lecture to 
HR people, health and safety people, lawyers, uh, human guys, operations directors, it makes no difference. They have very little knowledge of toxicology. Yes, yeah, the toxicology that provides the evidence that causes a course of action to be taken within the substance misuse management program. So it's worthwhile having training in the workplace to understand how that toxicology will be applied, will also be reviewed because if you get a laboratory that comes back and says this is consistent with prescribed medications, but the guy hasn't got a prescription, then he's using black market prescribed meds. So you do need more support from the analytical world. Some are very good, some are very poor. They'll just say negative or positive. That isn't good enough. Because when you're going to manage someone through an employee assistance program, you need to understand what the size of the nature of the substance misuse problem is that you're dealing with. Can they be recovered within a reasonable time? Or is this gonna be a four to five year maintenance program, which isn't really, feasible in the workplace. So there's a lot of things with toxicology that you've still got to apply. I'm trying to find my cursor, it's disappeared. If I can outline to you guys now, um, the basic phases of an employee assistance program. Now this will be different for people who are serving at sea on uh, rigs um, or residence vessels. Um, deep sea or coastal, it makes no difference. You cannot run a three month or four month EAP to recover somebody back into the workplace, trying to get them clean from specific substances. But the first two parts are the same. So the treatment history, when somebody self refers or you decide you're going to rehabilitate somebody, you've got to go to their GP with their consent, they must sign a form and have a, a, a visibility at least, or, or view, overview of their treatment history. Have they been using methadone on prescription for three years and not declared it at the point of interview? Are they using buprenorphine? Are they using benzos? Are they using other prescribed medications which have some very serious comorbidities? These are things that you need to know to be able to manage these people through that EAP. At the same time that that process has started, we take a hair analysis from that donor or that person. Reason for that is we are looking for a wide window uh, overview of their historical substance misuse. So if we use hair analysis, each half an inch of hair is 30 days approximate history of substance misuse. We tend to restrict workplace hair testing to three centimeters or an inch and a half. I'm not quite metric just yet. Um, so that we've got that 90 day history of whatever they've been up to. That hair, if it's in one continuous length, can be segmented and it can be used to see if somebody's been uh, had a spike drink defense or whatever, because we can uh, analyze each segment independently. What this does for us, <laughs> it tells us if they're telling the whole story, because what we often find with substance misuses, abusers, or dependents. They don't even tell their GP the full problem or the full scale of the problem. So when we get the hair result back with the GP records or doctor's records, that's when we sit and look with that individual to see if there are any other unidentified or unmet needs, something they haven't declared, because there's no good starting a program which might be two or three months long, if it's at all possible to do that, and then find out at the end of that month we've, or three months, we've got another problem. We need to know the full scale of the problem right from the get-go. And the treatment history of GP records and the hair analysis is what gives us that ability to sit with the donor and say, right, you've got a major problem. You're using multiple drugs. We've got crack cocaine here. We've got cocaine, we've got cocaethylene, we've got amphetamine. You've got all these other compounds. You're a cocktail substance misuser. Is that person really going to be able to complete a very rapid workplace intervention? I would suggest not. And that's at, the, it's at that point you have to make the commercial decision. If we agree that these people are coming into this workplace employee assistance program, for whatever reason it may be, 
We then have to set a treatment profile. That treatment profile will be different for each individual. All have different uh, reasons for getting involved in drugs, and that's a complex, complex subject in itself, in its own rights. The treatment profile is not the same for recovering cocaine as it is for heroin, as it is for cannabis, as it is for other things. So that treatment profile has to be set and agreed. And the, the employee has to agree that if they need to be taken from a risk position in the workplace and removed from it to a safer position or even suspended, at this stage we do that. Uh, till we get them to a level where they titrate down from a certain level of drug to a level where we can be better managing them in the workplace or either while they're still on uh, suspension um, or through other programs run within the community. The treatment outcome, well, that's again another phase re response. The treatment outcome has to be a structure. And that structure is, if they've been suspended during treatment to get them clean because we can't allow them to drive under the influence of illegal drugs or attend the workplace unfit through the use of illegal drugs, but they've self-referred and caught you on the hop and you can't dismiss them. That's a management protocol that's got to be examined uh, as we move forward. But the second one is, once you've made that management protocol, if there's a reasonable adjustment during treatment that can be made, you should try and make it. It might mean a possible pay adjustment, which means a new set of terms and conditions while you're in rehabilitation. Those terms and conditions are then applied as to whether or not you comply with your rehabilitation. The company is trying to help that individual, but if they're throwing it back in their face and, uh, and uh, it's not working for them, or they're failing to attend uh, treatment sessions, and I'm afraid that's a dismissal. It's non-compliance with the EAP. If they start to do well, there's two options then. A phased return to work, so part-time work, to bring them back into the fold, might be to the same position, might be to a different position, but it gets them back into the routine in the workplace and back with their colleagues who usually stood by them throughout this whole process. I've never seen anybody get anti with it. Uh, or that full return to work to the original position they left. It could be that because they're a lorry driver and they're still titrating or they're still going through drug treatments, they will have lost their driving license. They might have lost their captain's license while they're in treatment. There's other areas where these things would maybe suspend them from doing their core position in work. The final one, of course, here is, if after all of this treatment, nothing's happening, we, we keep doing hair tests through this and we find that their drug intake's increased or it's remained the same all the way through, then you have to come to a not fit for work decision. And then they are dismissed. They have to be because you've done as much as you can to recover them back into the workplace and make a safe working environment for them and for their colleagues around their own misuse, abuse or disorder. That's the sad fact of that. If you haven't got that process to get to that decision-making machinery, you're going to struggle. You might find yourself in litigation or unfair dismissal. You might find that you're not able to consistently and effectively deal with everybody the same, which is one of the ACAS guidelines that says that is the role of the policy. Well, it's actually the role of the, um, the intervention as opposed to the policy. Policy is not up for grabs with anything. So when we start to look at then the testing, what is a program of testing? It's the use of narrow and wide window test mediums to test an employee's fitness for duty. Makes sense. And compliance with terms and conditions of employment and or compliance with specific criminal and civil legislations statutory requirements. The test mediums used in the workplace are either one, non-evidential stroke due diligence screening devices, which are the start of a process, or two, evidential analytical testing processes to prove or disprove a sample analysis. And that's the end of a program of testing. I'll spend some time on this. Uh, usually in the classroom, I would ask questions and I get a range of answers. I've got to give the answers here, then explain the question. 
A breath test device in the UK, used by the police and used in the workplace on many, many occasions, is a non-evidential device. It's a screening device. You cannot dismiss people on it. It's the start of a process. The police officer in the UK, when they use a home office type approved breath test device, under the Act, the Road Traffic Act, there is, have a power of arrest and detention to take a person back to a police station to do another form of evidential testing. Now, this only applies to a constable in uniform in this country. When I moved from uniform to CID, I could no longer breathalyze people. So what makes you think the workplace has more powers than a constable in uniform under an act of parliament? And it would be the same in your countries elsewhere around the world. In America, there are evidential devices because the FDA and the various regulatory bodies have said so. And those devices, you can be taken straight to court or affirmative action can be taken off the result of it. However, everywhere else doesn't have that. In the UK, we have nobody that said, actually, this is good enough to take your license off you for a year. So you've got to be bearing in mind that these non-evidential screening devices, now that's saliva and urine as well, where you've got your instant throwaway devices with a reading, are not evidential. They're the start of the process that says a person appears to be not meeting their legal duty to be fit for work. Now, if that resonates with you, what do you do then? Do you dismiss people on that result? Well, no, you can't because you've got no evidence. It's a catch-all test device. Certainly for full-time staff, there's nothing you can do other than move to a back-to-lab collection um, of a urine sample if you've done a urine non-evidential. It must be like for life. If you're using non-evidential devices, and the reason I put due diligence into brackets is due diligence is applied where short-term contracts are applied, where people have no contracts, but they've got a two-week job. So let's say there's a subcontractor coming out to a vessel for two weeks. Well, we're not going to pay for a great big uh, back-to-lab test, which isn't that expensive, actually. Uh, we're going to do a due diligence instant test on them. Well, that's straight away, you can say, because they've got no um, contract with the company at this stage. Their contract is between their, their owner's company and the employer, which would be yourselves. That person could be prevented from coming to your site or could be dismissed from site. You can't take any other affirmative action against that person. You cannot discipline. It's not your employee. So you've got to think very hard around this non-evidential element of testing. So instant saliva, instant urine and breath tests are screening devices. When we come back to the back to lab analysis, the back to lab analysis is a urine or saliva sample or hair sample or sample of nail clippings or samples of body hair. It come back to the laboratory with various windows of detection. Those samples are put through mass spec, usually LCM, SMS, or quadrupole. Um, some operations still do um, GCMS. However, that's fading away now as it requires derivatization of the samples in the process and makes things uh, take a little bit longer. We want to have our samples back from the laboratory as quickly as possible. So our providers guarantee a maximum of 72 hours 80% of our samples are back to the client within 24 hours. So this is the thrust of where you need to be. Evidential, non-evidential. What actions do you take? This has to be covered in your policy. You must have in your policy what test mediums you're going to use against your employees. Or those employees are you going to manage? What tools in the toolbox are you going to bring to bear against those employees? I think, um, as far as I'm aware, that's close to the 45 minutes. There's a lot more to get into with this. The book, Managing Workplace Substance Misuse, by me, has everything you need in it. It even has template policies in it, how to, how to interpret policies, all the step-by-step -step guidelines. Our master's degree course and our other courses are designed 
to help the workplace become self-sufficient and keep costs down with the least amount of business interruption. And on that basis, um, that's a good point to end. And I thank you for your attention. I thank all of you for um, plumbing into this. And I'll now take questions from Mark, if there's any. Okay, thank you, Trevor. And uh, I think it was uh, a really interesting presentation which highlights the, the complexity of the whole subject. And I think to your credit, you managed to squeeze all that into a 45 or 50 minute presentation. So, so again, thank you very much. Um, so people listening to this webinar, you now have the opportunity to post any questions that you may have for Trevor. So Trevor, I'll start with, with something which I know um, is, is, is kind of a, a favorite hobby of yours. And it's a question you've been asked many times and I'll, and I'll read this out. Uh, as most substances are classed as recreational, that suggests to me that maybe some senior people in the company may also be affected. As per your st statement that society brings the issue to work, is that your experience? And what, uh, sorry, and would this be a factor in a lot of companies not implementing strict testing procedures? Yes, it's a simple answer. I hate the phrase recreational, as you well know, Mark. Recreational, what is that? If it's an illegal drug, it's criminality. It's not recreational. We don't have recreational burglars. We don't have recreational car thieves. We don't have recreational, well, we do have recreational murderers, but they tend to be few and far between, thankfully. So the phrase recreational dilutes the severity of what substance misuse management is all about. And it suits the purpose of those that would use it. And that's all. The workplace, um, yes, people are frightened of uh, the fact they will have to dismiss half their workforce. If we say one in four people test positive, it, it's a shocking statistic, but that's only on illegal substances. We've got some equally shocking statistics on legal substances as well. So it's not the case. A substance misuse management program is not there to dismiss people. Happily dismiss drug dealers and pushers. They've got no place in society, never mind the workplace. But other people are victims of substance misuse through a myriad of different problems and they need help and the workplace is a great place to get help as long as the program's there to protect the workplace and protect the employees so i think it's um, a misnomer that you would lose a lot of people in the workplace it's not been my experience i've worked with small smes and companies with over a hundred thousand staff we've never had to have mass dismissals rationalizations of the business we have taken out multiple drug dealers out of warehouse operations and other scenarios. However, that's what you would expect. And that's what other employees would expect their employer to do. The employer is not doing it. It presents a bigger problem. Next one, Mark. Thank you, Trevor. Um, sorry, I'm uh, a bit slow on the questions. This one refers to uh, access to, to, to uh, doctors, etc. Should treatment history, uh, so yes, yeah, sorry, should treatment history information be reviewed by a healthcare professional, a nurse, etc., to ensure that it's reviewed accurately? Well, the accuracy of it comes with the actual in, uh, interpretation of the GP's records. We've never had a situation um, where a GP has just sent us these records and say, look, get stuck in. The point of consent to get to GP records is also the point at which the employee tells their employer that their, their, um, their GP that their employer is going to help them. And we encourage the GP to be part of that process. We then also give the opportunity through the uh, donor to give the GP the donor's hair result. So if that donor hasn't told the GP that they're also doing cocaine, uh, apart from the heroin or stimulants with depressants, that GP gets an update as well. And the whole idea of rehabilitation around treatment history, treatment outcome, profiles, et cetera, is that we all work together to get that person free from this cancer, if you want to call it that, that sits in society untreated. We can't allow this to be happening in the workplace because people get killed. We know this with the offshore, they've got a high incidence of uh, fatalities. Um, so, yeah, um, we get no issues with it. We've not had any issues with it at all. 
Thanks, Trevor. Uh, another question. Uh, if an employee has been found to be under the influence of alcohol on work premises uh, against, sorry, it's the uh, screen has just moved, against the, the management's consent and the company's policies, is it to be assumed the person is to be suspended? suspended? What follow-up support is deemed suitable from the employer before taking into consideration to dismiss the, the employee permanently? Okay, the alcohol issue is uh, probably the most prevalent one, to be honest, because alcohol is legal. And people do overindulge. I overindulge. I'm an ex-Navy guy. But I know my duties when I come into work the next day. I know that I shouldn't drive a vehicle on a road under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And we have legislations in the UK for that now, with regards to legal drugs as well. So just to give you an idea, in this country, you can be arrested and detained by being under the influence of prescribed medications while driving a vehicle on a road. So this awareness of people's limits, their tolerances, what they should and shouldn't do, their terms and conditions of employment, needs to be part of a, an employee's enhanced induction into a company. Now, when it comes to alcohol, and it's against the policy, let's say they blow over the company limit, any company can set an alcohol limit if they wish. In the UK, ours is 35 micrograms per 100 milliliters of breath. We've got one of the highest in the world. For the life of me, I don't know why. Other countries sit around 20, 22. Uh, other sectors and industries, it's zero in, in the maritime law, four hours before you start a shift. And in the aviation industry, it's nine micrograms for uh, cabin crew, pilots, air traffic controllers, uh, specified engineers. The offshore industry, uh, I've tried to introduce the... Um, aviation maximum limit of nine well if you can keep it as low as you can there shouldn't be a great uh, many circumstances where people are going to be massively over and some people can still be over the company limit set but still under the legal drink drive limit for their country so this becomes a disciplinary situation without the need for going into expensive um forward thinking testing around hair analysis to see if we've got a chronic issue. We might still do that because uh, drugs stay in hair permanently in proportion to use. That includes alcohol. So we can measure if somebody's got a chronic alcohol uh, misuse issue uh, and say, well, this has got to be managed in a different way to somebody who's been out the night before, been to a party, a barbecue, whatever, and come in a little bit worse than where the next day. So I think depending on the circumstances of the alcohol test, and the contributory factors around that, if it's just a simple carryover from the night before, people should be advised, verbally warned, and then that record is kept. And if, they've, if they're repeat offenders with alcohol, you can, you can then move certainly to the consideration of dismissal. If, however, you discover that they've got a severe alcohol problem, bordering on alcoholism, you've got to have some means to find that out. Now, if they don't admit to it, you ask them to provide a hair sample, and then we'll find out and tell them they've got a severe alcohol problem. It's at this stage most people break down because they haven't realized how bad their problem is. And they appreciate your help. So it's again a question of what is the circumstances of the test? What are the background um, situations that are applied to that particular test as well? Does that Thanks, answer that Trevor. one, Mark? Yeah, thanks for that, Trevor. Uh, hopefully an easy one. Um, is there a link to your book and, and, and various publications? I'm sure you can add that to your, your slide notes relatively simply. Yes, we can. It's published by Routledges, Taylor and Francis. It's available globally, all over the world, Waterstones, Barnes and Noble, Amazon even. Uh, it's cheaper on Amazon, by the way, guys, because they don't pay uh, VAT. So you'll get quite a good deal on Amazon. Thanks, Trevor. A uh, couple of questions that are... That are, are pretty much linked around legal highs and the, we know the law changed in 2016 but uh, the, the questions revolve around um, can legal highs be or illegal highs be picked up during the current screening processes? Yes, NPSs um, or new psychoactive substances are part of standard testing now and we can apply them to any test panel that we create for a client and if we have a well, let me explain. We sometimes put undercover employees into the workplace to identify problems and flush out drug issues, 
criminality issues and management compliance issues. We might find in that basis that there's a local or a demographic incidence of high psychoactive substance use. We would therefore tell our client of that finding, or if we've got local knowledge, because we do liaise with a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies, we might tell our client, look, you're not testing positive for uh, any heroin at the minute. Why don't we change that and have a look for some, uh, some mamba or some uh, synthetic cannabinoids uh, or MCAT, meow, meow. And we can change the, the, the panel of drugs at the laboratory. They're all available for analysis. Thanks, Trevor. Um, interesting question on uh, anabolic steroids misuse. Um, there's certainly have some evidence that it changes personality traits, etc. Um, what's your experience on the use of uh, anabolic steroids? Yeah, um, I got my muscles by working in a gym. I didn't get, I didn't get mine from a needle. Uh, the problem with anabolic steroids is they do cause mood swings. They are chemicals. Chemicals and the tolerance to chemicals injected or ingested into the body are going to react with different people in different way. There is some evidence to suggest that uh, people who use a lot of anabolic steroids are more aggressive. They have bigger mood swings and they're less able to perform sex. But I'll not go into that at this stage. Um, but anabolic steroids in the UK, you can legally buy them from a, a licensed source. You cannot buy them from the internet and import them through Latvia is what's going on a lot at the minute. So unless, unless you bought it from a, a, a legal source, it's illegal. If you give somebody your own personal anabolic steroids to use, it's illegal. You become then a dealer of anabolic steroids. You must obtain your own from a licensed source where you get the best advice about the side effects of anabolic steroid use or overuse. Thanks again, Trevor. Um, a question about random testing. Uh, how often would you recommend random testing takes place? Okay, random testing I'm not a great fan of. People call it a, de de a deterrent. The deterrent is your policy, your program, and your terms and conditions of employment. If people know you've got a robust program, and you're going to use that robust program when required, that should be determined enough. I do accept that other companies feel more comfortable that random testing is a deterrent in its own right and can be applied as required. Random testing comes in two forms. One is that you use an instant test device, and if you get then a presumptive positive or a non-negative, you've got no options other than to suspend that person while you do a back to lab test device and you suspend them on full pay which makes the eight pounds fifty or ten dollar test actually quite expensive by a hundredfold the alternative to that is to do random testing using back to lab evidential only and again um, don't confuse random testing with four cause testing if you have a suspicion that something going on that is a four cause test random testing is just saying right we want to do 10% of today's workforce. We'll pick the numbers randomly. And if, if I'm in court opposite you, I will ask, how did you achieve that random nature of the chosen people? Uh, because that's uh, an evidence scenario as well, because people claim to be victimized. It's a question for the company. How many people do they want to look at? If you look at one in four people of a company of a thousand people, that's at least 250 people who are using drugs and possibly dealing drugs. If you're only testing 10 people a year, is that a random protocol that's fit for purpose? I don't think it is. So it's a question of applying your random protocol across all shift patterns, across all locations, equally to everybody. And don't forget, in the random testing protocol, you could be picked the same, you can pick the same guy seven times off the bounce. It's totally random then the same person be reselected. So that's not actually dealing with the problem. You might be picking the good guy while the bad guy's getting away with it. So the question for me, or the, the answer for me is, look at how many people you have in your business, work on the basis that one in four or one in five will misuse substances, illegal substances without prescribed meds, et cetera, and then measure how many people you think you should be testing and when. 
closer to um, music festivals, closer to the Super Bowl, the FA Cups, the rugby, uh, in, you know, the World Rugby Cup. These are instances when people go off the rails. That might be a time to bring in a bit more random testing. So it's not just about how many, it's about when. Thanks, Trevor. I'll try and squeeze in another three or four. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, can you explain in more detail why, why there is a need for an amnesty period? The amnesty period gives the company time to consult with the uh, employees and examine through HR and other, uh, other routes. Uh, is there a need for terms and conditions of employment change? It is a change to people's terms and conditions. You are applying criminal law in the workplace. People need to be trained. You don't just conjure up a policy out of thin air or download one off the internet, which you can, but I'll see you in court on that one because it's going to fail. Your policy needs to be bespoke to your business. And if you've got a business with multiple sites across multiple countries with multiple uh, operations, which might include logistics, aviation, uh, maritime, etc., you've got to deal with a whole range of different problems. So every substance misuse policy for me needs to be bespoke. That amnesty period gives you the time to bespoke that and then deal with people who are actually self-referring because you announce, or the senior guy in the uh, company announces, right, we're going to start drug testing, we're going to do it tomorrow. How are you going to do that that quickly? Yes, you're going to work behind the scenes, proceeding all of this, but there's a time process. Don't hide this from the employees. Why should you hide it? They're entitled to know if there's going to be changes to their T's and C's. They're entitled to know what might happen in the workplace when they have an incident. They're entitled to know what's going to be happening on the, on the way to work, to or from work, or while they're out in the wider world. You've got to bring all this to bear to build your substance misuse management program across all of those elements we've covered today. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, another one on policy. Uh, how could a policy deal with refusal to give a sample uh, and the person who asked the question says, ours currently results in dismissal. Yeah, and that's quite right. A refusal is taken as a dismissal. You cannot, and I see this a lot in other policies, if you refuse to submit to a, a substance misuse test, it will be treated as a positive test. What a load of rubbish. You cannot turn a refusal into a positive test. A refusal has to be in your policy as a gross misconduct, which can lead uh, to the disciplinary procedure being invoked up to and including dismissal. So that person is quite correct in their policy. It's a gross misconduct. It's part of their terms and conditions. And staying drug free is one of those T's and C's is a continued uh, condition of uh, continued employment, sorry. It's a condition of continued employment. So these are the little things that need to be sorted out in the amnesty period. Thanks, Trevor. A uh, couple of questions very similar again on uh, alcohol levels. Our com uh, certain companies want to introduce a zero tolerance policy. Do you think this is possible to enforce? Um, yes, it is. But you've got to manage people's um, absorption and uh, how they expel alcohol from the body. Everybody's different. In my days in the Royal Navy, our level of alcohol intake was probably uh, measured in the civilian world as being an alcoholic, but that was our normal tolerance. And people's tolerances change. A zero tolerance, well, how you're going to deal with um, all elements of that is quite straightforward because before you breath test somebody, if you're gonna be using breath analysis on this, You've got to give them 20 minutes if they've used mouthwash, drank, eaten, smoked, uh, or even vape these days to make sure there's no residue uh, alcohol. Um, so you've got to give them 20 minutes. If there's a reading, you've got to give them another 20 minutes to make sure um, that the, the process is correct. And, and you're looking to see if the alcohol intake is rising or falling in the body. So these are the methods by which you examine if somebody's drinking while at work. Um, as opposed to coming into work with residue of the night before. It is possible. It's certainly more easy in the offshore industry where you make uh, the ships dry or you make the rigs dry. Um, it's a little bit more difficult where people are allowed to go off site during a lunch break and go and have a meal. Great, great Trevor. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions around access to, to your data and, and information about the courses you run. So perhaps we can put that on the 
on the slide set. Uh, last yeah. one, and I, I know it's, um, it's, it's another favorite of yours. Uh, in some countries, and indeed in certain states of the United States, uh, certain drugs which we would class as illegal are now classified as legal. How, how should that be managed? Just the same as any other legal substance, just like alcohol. A company can set its standard for the uh, presence of that legal substance in the body at the time a person's in their workplace. Now, the thing is with uh, cannabis, if you're using uh, a urine sampling process, cannabis being as strong as it is these days, up to 40% pure THC, in the old days, it used to be about 7% in my days, uh, it's a different beast altogether. And therefore, if you're, you're sampling people with urine, they can keep that cannabis in their fatty tissues and in their body for 28 days. If you're using saliva, it's uh, probably a maximum of 48 days. Uh, 48 hours, sorry. So it depends which test medium you're applying here. Uh, but people's contracts, terms and conditions of employment, again, have to be shown that they're not under the influence of substances, which includes alcohol, in the workplace. And they have that legal duty to be fit for purpose. How you interpret then a um, toxicology report around somebody's body saturation of cannabis or other drug is another matter. And that takes a lot more in-depth thinking and a lot more uh, application between the employer, providers like us, and the employee. Because you'll have a lot of problems where people are hitting it quite hard at the weekends. It'll be in the system all week. But they won't be under the influence of it because cannabis lasts is a hit depending on the strength of it about an hour and a half the fact is they can't go out at the coffee break and took on a spliff that would be against the policy and that would still leave them under the influence of cannabis at work okay greatly appreciated thank you very much again trevor for your time and your, and your very in-depth uh, ex explanations um all the contact details etc will be provided on the slide sets Apologies if I didn't answer or Trevor didn't answer all the questions. They've been flooding in even as we speak, and we will endeavour to make sure they're all published on, on, on the website, as well will be the, the contact details of Trevor uh, and links to publications, courses, etc., like that. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much for attending. I hope you found it useful. And um, have a safe and prosperous end, uh, uh, end of the day. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, guys. Thank you.